Hello friends, my name is Kumar Arpit and I welcome you to this course on World Trade Organization. Before I begin the lesson, here is a brief introduction of mine and a small request. If you think that this course is helping you in any way, then please consider rating, reviewing and recommending it. Okay, this means a lot to us. Now in today's lesson, we are going to deal with some of the important theories of international trade. So what I'm going to do today is uh, introduce you to some of the key theories, key concepts and key terms of international trade, okay, which we are going to use throughout the course. Okay, so let us begin. Now, World Trade Organization, as the name suggests, this particular organization deals with trade. And to be precise, it deals with international trade. And by international trade, we mean selling and buying of goods and services between the countries. Okay, so international trade involves selling and buying of goods and services. And when a country sells something, we say that it is exporting. Okay, export is happening. And when export happens, a country gets money. Similarly, when a country buys something, okay, we sell, we say that import is happening. Okay, import is taking place. Okay, and when import happens, a country has to give money, it has to spend money. Okay, so from this situation, a concept arises in international trade that is called balance of trade. Okay. And in this concept, in this concept of balance of trade, we are interested in knowing the difference between the total export and total import of a country. Okay, so when the total export of a country is more than its total import, then we say that the situation is of trade surplus. Okay, that means when there is trade surplus, a country is earning more and spending less. Okay, similarly, when the total export of a country is less than its total import then the situation is called trade deficit okay so in trade deficit a country spends more sorry spends more and earns less okay so this is the situation now we can say that international trade give rise to these two situation of trade surplus and trade deficit okay now trade surplus is an advantageous situation every country would like to be in this condition of trade surplus why because you are having more money at in your hand after the after the trade is over okay and you can use that money for any purpose so those country who are having trade surplus quite regularly they will always want to have you know international trade they will want more and more of international trade to happen but those country who have continuously trade deficit for them international trade is not that good okay they will they will want less and less of international trade to happen because when a country suffers trade deficit okay it has to spend extra money and that extra money comes from the revenue base of its of the country okay so the countries which have trade surplus they support international trade and they come up with a theory for international trade that is called economic liberalism similarly the countries which most often suffer trade deficit okay they don't support international trade okay and they come up with a theory that is called mercantilism so these are the two theories of international trade which we are going to see today okay now let's start with economic liberalism as i told you this theory is uh, um given by or this approach is adopted by those countries who have internet who have trade surplus in international trade so economic liberalism says that international trade is advantageous it is advantageous and it more and more international trade should happen it is good and it is good and it is it is it is for overall welfare it brings overall welfare okay now if a country is having trade deficit in short run then this theory says that it will have trade surplus in long run the situation will not remain constant okay it will have trade surplus in long run now economic liberalism the theory of economic liberalism it supports free trade okay it supports free trade it advocates the removal of all types of restriction okay all types of barriers stopping international trade and economic liberalism the theory of economic liberalism uses another theory to support its propositions its assumption and that theory is called comparative advantage theory and we need to see that what this comparative advantage theory is 
Now, comparative advantage theory was developed by Adam Smith and David Ricardo around 18th century. Okay, this theory says that a country should specialize in the production of those goods and services which it can produce in the best way. Okay, so a country should produce only those goods, only those services which it can produce in the best way. Now, we will be able to understand this theory in a better way if we take an example Japan and Saudi Arabia. Japan is known for its cars. It is the world is global leader in the production of car. Similarly, Saudi Arabia is known for oil. So Japan is efficient in, in the production of car. It can produce car in the best way. It has all type of natural resource, human resource for the production of cars. Similarly, Saudi Arabia, it can produce oil in the best way. So we can say that Japan has comparative advantage in case of cars and Saudi Arabia has comparative advantage in case of oil. Now, if Japan wants to produce oil, it won't be able to do it in an efficient way. Similarly, Saudi Arabia won't be able to produce cars in an efficient way. But both need, Japan need oil, Saudi Arabia needs car. Okay, so what should happen? According to comparative advantage theory, Japan should simply import oil from Saudi Arabia and specialize in the production of car and Saudi Arabia should import car from Japan and specialize in the production of oil and if this is going to happen then this will be the best case scenario both the countries are going to get benefited and overall welfare is going to increase so this is what comparative advantage theory says okay now the next theory is mercantilism and, I, and as i told you this theory is uh, given by this approach is adopted by those countries who suffer trade deficit quite regularly okay and trade deficit is something which is against national interest why because your revenue your, your revenue reserve get depleted okay so mercantilism this theory says that a country should focus on its individual interest on its own interest and if international trade is hurting the interest of a country then the country should not participate in it it should not participate in international trade okay mercantilism favors politics over economics it means that government should regulate economy okay government should regulate economy on the other hand the theory of liberalism it says that politics it's it favors economics over politics Okay, it says that government should not regulate economic economy, but mercantilism, it says that government should regulate economy. Okay, and it is concerned about its own interest and not about the welfare, global welfare. Okay, and mercantilism give rise to another set of policy measures that is called protectionism. Okay, mercantilism give rise to another set of policy measures that is called protectionism. Now, let us see what protectionism means. Protectionism is the policy of protecting domestic industries from foreign competition. Okay, foreign competition. So if international trade is happening, foreign companies are going to come to one country, okay, and it is going to bring its cheap product there. And if the domestic if the domestic producers are not able to compete with a cheap product of foreign companies, then what is going to happen that these domestic producers are going to be thrown out of the market. Okay, so protectionism says that domestic industries should be protected from foreign competition and for doing that for doing that it uses many methods many tools and one of the most important and widely used method of protectionism is tariff barriers tariff so what are tariff tariff are the tax that are imposed on imported good at the point of entry these are the tax that are imposed on imported goods at the point of entry so when tax is imposed on an imported good then what will happen that its price will rise okay suppose before getting imported the price of a good is rupees 100 government imposes a tax of 50 percent now its price will become 150 okay so this is a direct method of reducing or discouraging international trade okay but there are some indirect methods also the indirect methods that is discouraging international trade stopping imports from coming into the country without directly without directly imposing tax on it these indirect methods are called non-tariff barriers okay non-tariff barriers so if a country is not able to put tax on an imported good then it resort to non-tariff barriers and what are non-tariff barriers like import quotas a country can limit the number or the amount of a good that can be imported within a given period of time okay it can limit the number suppose government limits the number of iphones from getting imported to india suppose it limits us to one lakh but the demand is 2 lakh. Government allows only 1 lakh in one year. Demand is 2 lakh. Demand is more, supply is less, the price is automatically going to go up. 
okay the next measure non tariff barrier is subsidies subsidies now government can provide monetary help to domestic producers okay now domestic producers they don't have very high technology so the cost of production for domestic producer is very high and if the cost of production is high then the price of the good is also going to be high the government what it does it give monetary support to domestic producers and when it provide monetary support in the form of subsidies then what is going to happen that the price is going to come down and when the price comes down then the goods are able to compete with the foreign company foreign foreign goods okay imported goods so this is subsidies the next is regulation domestic regulations now government can fix some regulation based on environmental and health related issues okay now if a if a good is going to be imported into india and the government fix some health related regulation environment related regulation that means conditions now those goods have to meet these conditions okay health and environment related condition and if those goods are not able to meet these conditions then they will not be allowed to be imported so these are domestic regulations these are all non tariff barriers okay now government takes help of both tariff and non tariff barrier to reduce or discourage international trade okay so now we have seen that there are two theories of uh, international trade one supports international trade another does not uh, don't support it that means discourages international trade economic liberalism and mercantilism now the international economic order that we see today this international economic order is made primarily by these countries developed countries okay us and uk and these countries have traditionally had trade surpluses okay they have trade surpluses so these country the economy of these country work on the principle of liberalism so the international economic order that we have today the international economic order that we have today the underlying principle the underlying theory of this international economic order is economic liberalism okay why because this international economic order is primarily made by these developed countries of western europe and north america okay so the international economic order that we have today is called liberal international economic order or leo wto imf world bank they are part of this liberal international economic order and so from the next lesson we are going to understand one of the important organization of this international economic international uh, in liberal international economic order leo that is wto okay that we are going to do from our next lesson we are ending the session here okay and from the next lesson we are going to see the history of wto history of wto starting from gat to uruguay round that is 1995 when wto was formed so we are ending the le lesson here okay we're going to see uh, we're going to meet in the next session till then take care of yourself thank you so much for watching keep learning and goodbye Hello friends my name is Kumar Arpit and I welcome you to this course on World Trade Organization before we begin the lesson here is a small introduction of mines and a small request if you think that this course is helping you in any way then please consider rating reviewing and recommending it okay this means a lot to us now in today's lesson we are going to understand the history of World Trade Organization we are going to see we are going to see the journey of world trade organization from gat to wto okay that is the task in our hand today so let us begin now as i told you the developed countries of north america and western europe they believe in economic liberalism okay they believe in this theory of economic liberalism they want international trade to happen they support international trade why because they have trade surplus quite continuously okay now they support international trade they support this theory of economic liberalism so they want that less and less barriers should exist for international trade okay but something strange happened in the year 1931 the tariff level the average tariff level for united states and major european countries it rose quite high it increased quite high now in this graph you are you can see the green line green line shows the average tariff level for these european countries and united states in the year 1931 okay it is quite high as compared to other years okay now what was the reason behind this well the reason was economic depression the great economic depression that struck the world in 1929 now this economic depression it caused widespread unemployment the growth rate was brought to down brought down to very low level so 
widespread unemployment was caused. So this economic depression, it forced even the liberal economies of North America and Europe to adopt mercantilist policy and safeguard their domestic industries from foreign imports. Okay. So the process of uh, doing this, that is adopting mercantilist policy was initiated first by USA when it passed Smoot Howley Tariff Act in 1930. Okay, in 1930, USA passes Smoot Howley Tariff Act, and this act raises the average tariff of the imported goods that are coming to USA to a very high level. Okay, it increases the tariff on the imported goods to a very high level. Now, you can see the table here America, USA, it increases its tariff first by passing this Smoot Howley Tariff Act. Now, in reaction to this, now in reaction to America, America's increase of its tariff other European countries also indulge in increasing their tariff okay now Britain Britain will raise its tariff against the American goods Belgium France Germany all the countries will raise their tariff okay the competitive raising of tariff is what we are going to see here okay all these uh, European countries so economic depression of 1929 it led to the passage of smooth Howley tariff act which acted like a trigger which acted like a trigger for what Economists call as tariff war, competitive raising of tariffs by all the other European countries. Okay, now the countries adopted a policy that is sometimes referred to as beggar thy neighbor policy. Okay, now this tariff war was one of the reason behind World War II. One of the reason behind World War II. Okay, now look at look here. If the economic behavior of countries in the international arena is not regulated is left unregulated then this type of situation can arise and we know that uh, before 1929 there was no international economic order to regulate the economic behavior of countries okay so when the world war ii was drawing to its close by 1944 it was clear that uh, world war ii is going to end in one or two years okay and who are going to be the winner it was also clear and the winner were going to be the allied power usa uk france these were going to be the winner it was quite clear now these would be winner of world war ii now they were quite concerned about the post-war global economy the nature of post-war global economy because they were aware that if the economic behavior of countries are left unregulated then tariff wars like situation can arise which can ultimately lead to some kind of uh, world war three okay so these would be winners of uh, world war two they met at a at a place called britain woods in usa new hampshire and they organized a conference there that is called britain woods conference in 1944 and they came up with a proposal for three type of economic institutions or international institutions which would regulate global economy imf IBRD and ITO, IMF, International Monetary Fund, IBRD, which later will become World Bank and ITO, International Trade Organization. Okay, so in 1944, the proposal for these three international organization comes. Okay, and who were the countries behind this proposal, especially USA and UK. Okay, now by 1947, by 1947, IMF and IBRD are going to become reality when they're going to come into existence. Okay, by 1947, but ITO was taking quite a lot of time it was taking quite a lot of time in 1944 there was a conference in Havana Havana conference a final draft agreement was prepared and that was called Havana Charter for ITO and it was required that all the countries should ratify this charter in their respective parliaments okay so 53 out of 56 country ratified and now every country was waiting for USA to ratify it in US Congress now Till ITO was not formed in 1947, there were no international organization or agreement to regulate international trade. So USA, it came with a proposal that it said that till ITO is not formed, let us make a temporary agreement which will regulate the international trade temporarily till ITO is not formed. So these countries met at a place called Geneva. Okay, and, and they came up with a proposal for temporary multilateral trade agreement. And that temporary multilateral trade agreement was called GATT, General Agreement on Trade and Tariff. Okay, and it came into effect in 1948 with 23 countries. Okay, so, and by 1950, it was made clear by USA that it is not going to ratify ITO. It is not going to ratify ITO. US Congress made it clear that ITO is not going to be ratified. So, the international trade, regulating international trade, completely came under the responsibility of GATT. 
okay because at that time we had only GATT regulating international trade okay now GATT is going to regulate international trade for the another 47 year till 1995 when finally an international organization that is WTO is formed okay so this was the story of GATT now GATT we need to we need, we need to know something about GATT GATT general agreement on tariff and trade first of all it was a temporary agreement remember it was an agreement it was not an organization it was an agreement temporary agreement it was made on temporary basis it was signed by 23 countries in June in January 1948 it regulated international trade for 47 years and the thing to remember here is that GATT was not an organization it was an agreement and the countries which participated in GATT, they were called contracting parties. Okay, they were not called members, they were called contracting parties. Okay, now the scope of GATT was limited to trade in goods and just tariff, tariff barriers. Okay, it excluded trade in agriculture and textile. These two commodities were excluded, agriculture and textile. Okay, now GATT was a temporary agreement but one important feature of GATT was that it was provisionally applied all the parts of GATT were not applied together in totality at once okay now if India is signing GATT and GATT has suppose 100 provisions so India will apply only those provisions of GATT which which don't come in conflict with the existing laws of the land okay that particular provision is called protocol for provisional application so GATT was applied provisionally okay and this right of a country to apply GATT provisionally so that it does not conflict any existing law of the land this particular right of a country was called grandfather's right okay so you need to remember this protocol for provisional application and grandfather's right okay now GATT worked on the basis of trade round. It was an agreement. So various trade rounds were organized and discussions were made, negotiations were made and agreements were made. Okay. So these are the various trade rounds which were organized under GATT. Now the final round that was organized under GATT was Uruguay round. Okay. And at the conclusion of this Uruguay round, finally WTO is going to come into existence. Okay. Countries are going to decide that. Okay. Now we are we need to move from an agreement to an international organization and finally WTO was born with the conclusion of Marrakesh agreement in Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations in 1994. Okay, WTO came into existence in January 1, 1995 with the membership of 128 countries. Okay, so in Uruguay round, WTO was formed. Okay, final round of GATT, Uruguay round, at the conclusion of it, WTO was formed. Okay, now we need to know what were the reasons behind the formation of WTO? Why we needed to move from GATT to WTO? Why it was needed? Now, as I told you, GATT was limited to trade in goods and just tariff barriers. Okay, but by 1970s, countries started using more and more non-tariff barriers and GATT was not uh, competent enough to deal with these non-tariff barriers. This was one reason. Next reason was that developed countries, they started having comparative advantage in trade of services. Apart from manufactured goods, developed countries started, started having competitive advantage in trade and services. They wanted to include service also within the scope of international trade. Okay. And the third reason was that developing countries, they wanted agriculture and textile to be included within the scope of international trade. Okay. Now service, agriculture and textile, all these were excluded under GATT. Okay. Now these, all these three topics needed to be included in the international trade regime so what happened is a grand bargain between developed countries and developing countries now developed countries agreed to include agriculture and textile within WTO and developing country agreed to include service and intellectual property rights within the scope of WTO and as a result of this grand bargain WTO was finally formed okay now we need to know some of the important working principles of WTO what are the fundamental principle of WTO on which principle it works? First is reciprocity. Reciprocity, it simply means if one country is raising, sorry, reducing tariff with respect to another country, then that country should also reduce its tariff with respect to the first country. So mutual lowering of trade barriers. Okay, thus country that lowered their tariff could expect their trading partners to do the same. That is called reciprocity. Okay, now the next principle was most favored nation. The MFN principle holds that the tariff preference granted to one state must be granted to all others in 
other words there could be no favored nation among members now suppose india is granting uh, mfn status to suppose germany now now the goods coming from germany india is going to limit uh, specify how much how much tax it is going to impose on goods coming from germany okay so it is going to provide mfn status to germany and it is going to specify how much tax it will impose on goods coming from germany now same level of tax india has to impose on all other countries of the world so if i am providing a mfn status to one country and i am dealing with that country in in one particular way then i have to deal in the same way with all other countries of the world i cannot discriminate among other countries of the world that is called mfn status okay now the third principle was national treatment it means simply that a country cannot discriminate discriminate between imported goods and domestic goods now if two goods are there in a country one is imported and one is manufactured domestically now a country cannot discriminate between them they a country has to treat a government has to treat both the goods equally okay this is what called national treatment when a good is and has finally entered the national boundary of a country it should be treated as a good domestically produced okay it should not be discriminated against the domestically produced good both the goods imported one and the domestically produced good they have to be treated equally that is what is called national treatment okay now finally we need to know what are the major differences between GATT and WTO. It is very important. So as I told you, GATT was just a multilateral treaty. It was an agreement, but WTO, it was an organization with membership. GATT was provisionally applied. We had protocol for provisional application in GATT, but in case of WTO, we, we, did not, we don't have any such provision. WTO needs to be applied completely. All the agreements, if someone is signed, becoming a member of WTO, it needs to apply all the agreements of WTO completely. No provision, provisional application, no grandfather's right. Okay. GATT was limited to tariff barriers and trade in goods, while WTO, it includes non tariff barrier, it includes trade in service, intellectual property rights. Okay. And the most important difference between GATT and WTO is that GATT has a very weak dispute settlement mechanism while wto it had a, it has a very strong dispute settlement mechanism okay so this is all about the history of wto we are going to end the lesson here we're going to meet in the next lesson where we are going to see the structure of wto okay so till then take care of yourself thank you so much for watching keep learning and goodbye hello friends my name is kumar arpit and i welcome you to this course on world trade organization before we begin the lesson, here is a small introduction of mines and a small request. If you think that this course is helping you in any way, then please consider rating, reviewing and recommending it. Okay, this small act of yours means a lot to us. In today's lesson, we are going to understand the organizational structure of WTO. And under this, we are going to see three aspects of WTO, that is its organizational structure, its decision making process and its dispute settlement mechanism okay so we are going to see how and in which way wto is organized how the decisions are taken in wto and when countries have dispute in wto then how those disputes are resolved okay so these three things we are going to see today in this lesson okay so let us begin with the organizational structure this is the organizational structure of WTO. At the top, we have ministerial conference. Okay, below it, there is general council. General council sometimes assumes the role of dispute settlement body and sometimes it assumes the role of a trade policy review body. Okay, so don't confuse between these three. These three are all same. General council sometimes becomes dispute settlement body general council sometimes become trade policy review body so these three are the same okay and below general council we have uh, three other councils like council for trade in goods council for trade related aspects of intellectual property right and council for trade in service okay now ministerial conference this is the topmost decision making body of wto it is actually a conference a meeting which is organized every two year in which the trade and commerce minister of every member country of WTO participates. Okay, so this is a conference, a meeting. Okay, it is organized every two years in which the member countries and their trade and commerce minister participate. 
Now, General Council, this is a body which is situated at Geneva. Okay, Geneva. It is situated at Geneva and it works from there. It is, a, it is Geneva. It is situated at Geneva and it works from there. Okay, and uh, General Council, under General Council, these three councils come and there are many other councils, commissions and working groups which are present in WTO and which come under this General Council. Okay, so this is all about the organizational structure of WTO. Now, we need to note some important points about the organizational structure of WTO. Okay, now first thing that WTO is a member driven institution. It is a member driven institution, unlike IMF and World Bank, which are staff driven institution. Okay, what it means by saying that WTO is a member driven institution. Now, the responsibility of negotiating agreements implementing those agreements implementing the decisions that are taken in ministerial conference the responsibility lies with members themselves okay there is no executive body in wto no executive body and the secretariat is also very small so you can say that wto is an organization which is made by the members for the members and of the members okay that is something which you can say now the secretariat is very small it is headed by a director general okay and um, the secretariat is situated at geneva okay and ministerial conference is the topmost decision making body of wto ministerial conference as i had as i have shown you here the ministerial conference it is the topmost decision making body of wto it comprises of trade and commerce minister of member countries okay so this was all about the organizational structure of wto now let's see the decision making process of wto now for decision making process there are two aspects one is what is the decision making process in theory in principle and what is the decision making process in practice in reality now in theory wto adopts voting procedure it should adopt voting procedure it has articles where it is written that it will adopt voting procedure and each country is given one vote one country one vote okay no matter who the country is rich poor developed developing no matter every country is given one vote and decision should be taken by simple majority now you see here now Two third of the members of develop, WTO are developing countries. That is, if you take the total members of WTO, then two third of it comprises of developing countries. Now, if this method is adopted, then no decisions are going to be taken by WTO, which is going to be against the interest of developing countries. Okay, because developing countries they will form the majority, simple majority. Okay, but this is not the case. WTO takes many decisions which are against the interest of developing countries. So it means that WTO does not follow this practice, okay, this method of decision making. So in practice, the decision making process of WTO is quite different and WTO is often criticized for its decision making process. The decision making process is quite informal, okay. Now WTO uses this consensus method for taking decision, consensus method. And this method was earlier used during GATT negotiations. Since GATT was not an organization, it was an agreement. So consensus method was used during GATT and that method has been carried or has been borrowed from GATT to WTO. So most of the decisions are taken by this consensus method. And in this consensus method, what should be done that the members should agree. All the, all the negotiating parties should agree. And this consensus method takes place in a small group in a small group a small meeting which are called green room meetings small closed door meeting take place and very few countries are invited in those meeting and they have to take decision on the basis of consensus okay this is called consensus method in practice wto takes decision by consensus method okay another principle is used for taking decision that is called principle supplier principle okay that means suppose india India wants to decide how much tariff it is going to put on import of oil. So India is going to negotiate directly with the principal supplier. That means with the main supplier. Okay. Suppose the main supplier is Saudi Arabia. So India is going to go directly to Saudi Arabia and it will negotiate the terms of trade with it. Okay. And now whatever the decision that is going to come, India is going to, uh, India is going to apply that decision for all the countries, potential all the countries from where India can potentially import oil. So that is called principal supplier principle. 
So a country will directly go to the principal supplier and negotiate the tariff and terms. That is something which is used in uh, decision making process in WTO. Okay, so some key observations about the decision making process in WTO. First that the decision making process involves informal methods. Okay, informal method and this informal method hurts the sentiment, hurt the interest of developing countries. And there is lack of transparency in the whole process. Many a time developing countries are not consulted in consensus building process. They are not even invited in the closed door green room meeting so this is something for which wto has often been criticized okay so this is all about the decision making process of wto next we move on to the dispute settlement mechanism it has often been called it has often been said that uh, dispute settlement mechanism is the jewel in the crown of wto okay it is one of the greatest achievement of wto to have such a robust such a firm such a such a fantastic decision making decision settlement me uh, mechanism okay now suppose two countries have dispute with each other related to some trade issue now take for example india and china they have dispute with each other now how they are going to resolve the dispute under this mechanism now first 60 day time period is given to consult with themselves now for 60 days india and china will try to solve their problem mutually by by having mutual negotiation and consultation they will try to solve their problem mutually for 60 days but after 60 days if the problem is not solved if the dispute is not resolved then what is going to happen a panel is going to be established a panel is going to be established within 45 days and this panel is going to see the matter okay this this panel is going to review the dispute that it is going to see what is the dispute between India and China and this panel will make will examine will examine the dispute it will make a report okay it will make a report on the dispute and this report will be submitted to dispute settlement body okay this report will be submitted to dispute settlement body remember dispute settlement body is general counsel as I told you, General Council sometimes assumes the role of dispute settlement body. So it is same General Council. So this panel is going to submit the report to dispute settlement body. Now support, suppose the report is against the interest of India. Now India wants to appeal against that report. So there is an appellate authority. India can appeal against that report, the findings of these panel. Okay. And this appellate authority is going to review the report within 60 to 90 days within 60 to 90 days it is going to review the report and it is going to submit the final report to DSB that is the dispute settlement body and within 60 days the dispute settlement body has to take a decision it has to decide and whether it decides in favor of India or in favor of China okay now suppose this dispute settlement body decides in favor of India and it says that China has done wrong and it should it should um, it should compensate India Okay, so the dispute settlement body gives some recommendations that uh, China should do this, this, this to India. It should compensate India. Now, if China, China has two options, either to implement the recommendation of dispute settlement body or not implement the recommendation. Now, if China decides not to implement the recommendation, not to implement the recommendation of dispute settlement body, not to compensate India. Now, in that situation, what dispute settlement body will do? It will authorize India. To retaliate against China okay retaliate against China it will say in the dispute settlement body will say India okay China is not following the command it is not following the decision now you can retaliate against China in any way you want okay so that is what dispute settlement body is going to do now India can retaliate against China what it can do it can stop all the imports coming from China it can raise the tariff for the imports coming from China to a very high level so these are all the things that can be done by India so this is the dispute settlement mechanism of WTO it is very strong and this this provision for retaliation this provision for retaliation makes the body even more strong okay so this was not possible during the GATT eras okay but in case of WTO this is possible now WTO its dispute settlement uh, mechanism is quite robust and it really helps developing country okay so this was all about the organizational structure decision making process and dispute settlement mechanism of wto okay so we are going to end the lesson here in the next lesson we are going to see some key agreements some important agreements under wto okay that what we are going to see in the next session so we are going to end the session here okay we are going to meet in the next uh, lesson. Till then, 
take care of yourself thank you so much for watching keep learning and goodbye hello friends my name is kumar arpit and i welcome you to this course on world trade organization before we begin the lesson here is a small introduction of minds and a small request if you think that this course is helping you in any way then please consider rating reviewing and recommending it okay this means a lot to us so in today's lesson we are going to understand some important agreements under wto okay wto contains about 60 agreements but all the agreements are not important for us for us the most important agreement is the one which establishes wto itself that is the agreement establishing wto now we are going to understand this agreement in greater detail this agreement is divided into four parts annex 1 annex 2 annex 3 and annex 4 okay each of these parts contain other agreements within them okay like annex 2 it deals with dispute settlement body annex 3 trade policy review annex 4 plurilateral agreement okay but for us the most important annex is going to be annex 1 which is again subdivided into three parts annex 1a 1b and 1c so we are going to deal with annex 1 in greater detail now annex 1 it contains three agreements three agreements one is the general agreement on tariff and trade that is called GATT 1994 the another one is general agreement on trade and service and the third one is trade related intellectual property right now we are going to understand all these three agreements in greater detail okay and we are going to begin with general agreement on tariff and trade GATT 1994 now here pay attention to the name of this agreement it is written GATT 1994 okay why because we have one more GATT that was made in 1947 but this GATT which is made in 1994 is different from that GATT okay the scope of GATT 1994 is far more wide than the scope of GATT 1947 this GATT GATT 1994 it includes non-tariff barriers along with tariff barriers okay GATT 19, 9, 1947 was limited to tariff barrier but 1994 GATT includes non-tariff barrier also okay so when a country signs this agreement general agreement on tariff and trade 1994 it is required to submit a tariff schedule to wto now what is this tariff schedule tariff schedule is like a list it is like a list where a country has to mention all the goods which it is going to import and and with each good it is going to specify the amount of tax the maximum amount of tax that it can levy that it can impose on those goods now suppose India requires to submit a tariff schedule to WTO now within that tariff schedule India will include three goods suppose three goods a B and C and with each good India will specify the maximum tariff that it is going to impose suppose with good a india is going to specify 10 percent with b 20 percent with c 25 percent so this is what is called tariff schedule now india cannot impose tariff more than what it has committed in the tariff schedule okay clear now tariff bindings when a country submits tariff schedule and it includes goods in it so those goods are called tariff bound tariff bound okay they are bound by tariff okay they are now under the watch of wto now before wto was made before wto was made developed country they included 78 percent of their imports within tariff schedule that means 78 percent of their imports were tariff bound but after wto 99 percent of their imports were tariff bound Similarly, for developing countries, 22% of their imports were tariff bond before WTO and after WTO, 72%. Okay, so this is quite a huge advancement. Okay, this, is, this shows that how effective GATT 1994 was. Okay, and is. Now, GATT 1994 along with these tariff schedule, it includes many other agreements. Many other agreements and the most important one are presented here. Agreement on agriculture and agreement on textile and clothing remember while wto was being made what was the demand of developing countries that to include agriculture and textile within the international trade regime so textile and agriculture was included within wto with these agreements agreement on agriculture and agreement on textile apart from this there are many other agreements which which is also important but we are going to see this agreement on agriculture in quite detail here 
okay now agreement on agriculture as i told you agriculture was excluded from international trade within GATT. okay before 1995 agricultural goods agricultural products they were not they were not a part of they were not regulated in international trade okay now country can impose tariff import quotas non-tariff barriers on agriculture good freely because they were not the part of GATT. okay so agreement on agriculture it tries to liberalize agricultural trade in three significant respects okay three significant ways these three ways are often called as three pillars of agricultural trade policies and they are market access domestic support mechanism and export subsidies okay so these are the three pillars of this agreement on agriculture and we are going to look at them in quite greater detail first pillar is called market access now as i told you before 1995 countries were free to put tariff and non-tariff barriers on agricultural goods okay they were free to put that but when a country signs agreement on agriculture what it is required to do that it has to convert all its non-tariff barriers into tariff now suppose USA, USA put 10 type of non-tariff barriers on agricultural import from India. Okay, when USA signs this agreement, what it has to do, it has to convert those 10 non-tariff barriers into tariff. And this process of conversion of non-tariff barriers into tariff is called tarification. Okay, now after a country has converted its non-tariff barriers into tariff, now it is required to promise, it is required to commit that it is going to reduce these tariff gradually over a period of time. This is called market access, opening the market for agricultural good. And the most important thing here is tarification. Okay, tarification. Next, uh, next pillar or next pillar of uh, agriculture trade policy is domestic support that is subsidies now a country often provides subsidy to its farmer to the agricultural sector to boost the production to make the agricultural goods cheaper okay it provides supports and the support can be grouped into two ways direct support and indirect support direct support are those which directly influence the production of agricultural product directly influence the trade of agricultural good they are called direct support these type of subsidies are called direct subsidies and these subsidies are categorized in a group which is called amber box amber box so those subsidies which directly influence agricultural production they are called trade distorting subsidies okay they directly influence the trade of agricultural product they are called amber box those subsidies are categorized in a group that is called amber box and the subsidies coming under amber box they are regulated they are restricted now there are other type of subsidies which don't affect don't affect the production directly they may affect indirectly but not directly they are called non-trade distorting subsidies okay these subsidies are grouped in two groups one is called green box the other one is called blue box so the subsidies coming under green box and blue box they are they are kept away from restrictions okay now amber box subsidies as i told you these are the subsidies which a government gives to the farmers and agricultural sector which directly influence the production agricultural production directly influence the trade and these subsidies are called trade distorting subsidies okay now wto makes arrangement that uh, when a country signs this agriculture agreement on agriculture then it has to limit its amber box subsidy and what is the limit it has to maintain a limit that is called de minimis de minimis is the minimal amount of amber box subsidy that is permitted by wto that is a minimum amount of subsidy that a country can give to its farmer okay under amber box direct subsidy that a country can give to its farmer that is called de minimis now for developed country it is five percent five percent of what 5% of the total value of agricultural production in the year 1986 and 88. Now suppose USA. USA has an agricultural production in the year 1986-88 worth rupees 1000 crore. Okay, 1000 thousand crore. Now USA is going to give 5% of that 1000 crore as direct subsidy to its farmer. 5% of 1000 crore. That, that 1000 crore is called aggregate measure of support. Okay, so this is limited 5%. Now, for developing country, the amount is 10%. Now, suppose India, India had about 100 crore, 100 crore worth of agricultural production in the year 1986 to 88. Now, India can give 10% of 100 crore as a direct subsidy to its farmer. That is the de minimis level. India cannot go beyond that. Okay, so this is called amber box subsidy. Okay, I think it is clear. 
Now, the other player, pillar is export subsidy. The country often encourage export of agricultural good by providing subsidy to it. Now, India want to promote the export of its agricultural product. Then what it can do, it can give domestic, it can give subsidies to the farmers. Okay, and when subsidies are provided to agricultural product, what happens is the cost become less, the price become less. So export subsidy under this uh, agreement on agriculture, export subsidy has to be reduced. Now developed country is required to reduce the export subsidy by 36% over a period of 6 years and develop con developing countries by 24% over a period of 10 years. So these are the three important pillars of agri agreement on agriculture. Now the next term. Um, agreement is agreement general agreement on trade and service as i told you developed countries were were very were eager to include service under the international trade regime and that is the part of the grand bargain that we talked about developed country agreed to include textile and agriculture in the international trade regime and developing country agreed to include service okay so service was included in the international trade regime in the wto with this particular agreement general agreement on trade and service now why developed countries were pushing for uh, inclusion of service why because by 1981 developed countries were having comparative advantage in the production of service now 66 percent of the gdp of the developed country came from service sector in 1981 and 67 percent of their employment now now developed country wanted that the trade in service should be regulated by wto and so it pushed for this particular agreement general agreement on trade in service so what this agreement does it include trade within the scope of wto and uh, under this agreement four sectors are of prime importance it deals with four sector okay movement of natural person financial service telecommunication and air transport so these are the four sectors which are included in general agreement on trade in service now one important thing i I want to mention here that is this particular agreement has an inbuilt agenda for successive negotiations agreement on agriculture also has an inbuilt agenda for successive negotiation it means that all the provisions all the negotiations that has been that that the countries have arrived within these agreements they are not fixed they are prone to negotiations that further negotiation can happen further provisions can happen okay more provisions can be added some provisions can be reduced so these agreements agreement on trade and service uh, uh, general agreement on tariff and trade and agri ag agreement on agriculture they all are they all have this built-in agenda for successive negotiations that means they are not constant they they can they can change themselves according to the situation according to the circumstances the provisions the negotiations the agreements all can the all can change okay that is what is called uh, agenda for successive negotiations country can negotiate and bring required change in these agreements so this is all about this is all about agreements of uh, the world trade organization one more agreement is there trade related intellectual property right but uh, time does not permit to deal with this agreement in this video so we are going to do this agreement uh, in the next video okay so we are ending the lesson here and uh, in the next lesson we are going to see this trade related intellectual property right so uh, till then take care of yourself thank you so much for watching keep learning and goodbye hello friends my name is Kumar Arpit and I welcome you to this course on World Trade Organization. Before we begin the lesson, here is a brief introduction of mine and a small request. If you think that this course is helping you in any way, then please consider rating, reviewing and recommending it. Okay, It means a lot to us. So in today's lesson, we are going to understand one of the important agreement under WTO, that is Trade Related Intellectual Property Right. Okay. In the previous lesson, we had seen some other agreements like GATT 1994, GATT. Okay, but in today's lesson, we are exclusively going to deal with this particular agreement, TRIPS, Trade Related Intellectual Property Right. Okay, so let us begin. Now, before understanding TRIPS, it is very important for us to understand what is intellectual property right. Okay, what is the meaning of intellectual property right? So by intellectual property, we refer to those ideas, inventions and discoveries that we get after a long period of research and development. Okay, so intellectual properties are those ideas, invention, discoveries which 
an individual or a group of individual arrive at after a long period of research and development okay so as we know that research and development these are very costly okay so it involves a huge cost so arriving at such ideas such inventions it involves a huge cost and the cost is not shared by all it is the cost is not shared by all only few people bear the cost of it bear the cost of the production of these ideas okay so intellectual property actually belong to those who bear the cost cost of the research and development but the benefits of intellectual property the benefits of these ideas these inventions they can be enjoyed by everyone okay if some invention is taking place some new idea is coming the benefit of that idea it can be enjoyed by ev everyone though the cost is not shared by all so intellectual property is like a public good it is like a public good if it if it, it if it is left unregulated then it behaves like a public good now public good are those goods and services which we enjoy without paying for it okay like a street light street light is a public good we don't pay directly for the installment of those street light but we enjoy the benefit of it okay road we don't pay directly for the construction of road and maintenance of it but we enjoy the benefit of it so they are like um, public goods okay so intellectual property also behaves like public good if it is not regulated so in, with intellectual property there is a problem called public good problem and this problem needs to be solved and in order to solve this problem in order to restrict the use of intellectual property only to those people who pay for it countries have often come up with some arrangement like patents trademark copyrights okay now these provisions these arrangements of patent trademark copyright it is easy to implement these provisions within a country okay within the boundary of a country okay but when intellectual property start getting shared between countries okay between two or more countries then it becomes difficult to regulate these patent trademark and copyright okay so in order to regulate the sharing and the transfer of intellectual property from one country to another country we needed an agreement and that is why we had this agreement called trips okay now intellectual property if if you want to ask if we ask a question that who are the exporter of intellectual property that means who actually produce intellectual property in the first place then it, it is a developed countries okay because developed countries they have the required infrastructure capital and know-how to come up with new ideas discoveries inventions so actually they are the one who are the owner of this intellectual property but developing country developing country they also need these intellectual property or developing country have two options they can buy the license of those inventions good uh, discoveries okay from the developed country like for take, take for example the formula for making a medicine a pharmaceutical company of a developed country suppose usa it has come up with a formula to make medicine for cancer now developing country also needs that medicine okay it also needs to manufacture that medicine because there are people in developing country who suffer from cancer now developing country what they can do they can either buy the license from the pharmaceutical company and then start producing the drug or they can illegally import the formula from some black market or third party okay so the second option is quite easy and it in case of second option the country will have to pay less so most of the country try to take up the second option okay in spite of paying directly to the to the pharmaceutical company buying the license getting the patent they tend to use the counterfeit okay so this is the problem with the intellectual property in international system so in order to regulate the transfer of intellectual property from one country to another country the flow of intellectual property the flow of these inventions ideas and discoveries one organization was created in 1967 okay world intellectual property organization to look after these transfer of intellectual property but this organization was not effective it was not effective enough to stop the use of counterfeits that counterfeits are the duplicate okay as i told you pirated version duplicate okay the illegal version of of the inventions the discoveries as i told you here the formula for making drugs for can cancer the medicine for cancer a country can illegally import the formula from a third party or from from some smuggler okay so 
the WIPO we put the title was ineffective in using the use uh, in stopping the use of counterfeit so it was hurting the interest of developed countries that they have spent a lot of money in research and development and on some countries using the formula illegally okay so it hurts the interest of developing developed countries so what developed country did they wanted to have an agreement within WTO which will regulate these kind of activities okay use of counterfeit if some country is using counterfeit then WTO can punish that country you know through the dispute settlement mechanism and as we have seen in the previous lesson okay so developed country wanted to include uh, trips within the scope of WTO okay and this was a part of grand bargain okay now developed country told to developing country if you agree including in intellectual property then we will agree including agriculture and textile so developing country agreed okay so this was a part of grand bargain and finally intellectual property was included within the scope of within the scope of uh, WTO now this intellectual property the, this agreement the trips that is a very complicated agreement it is a very complicated agreement it has 73 articles it has about 73 articles okay and um, seven major parts divided into seven major parts. now it covered areas like copyrights copyright trademark geographical indication patents layout design okay undisclosed information including trade secrets so all these areas are covered within trips so it's a very complicated agreement and a country who is joining WTO they have to sign this agreement and if some violation comes in these area then a country can drag that country into dispute settlement mechanism okay and if it is not accepting the recommendation then retaliation can take place okay so this is all about trade related intellectual property right trips now some point we need to observe about this uh, agreement now trips when a country signs trip the government of that country requires to modify the national legislation on patent copyright and trademark to bring them in line with new agreement so if in one way you see that after signing trips you have to make a you have to make a means arrangement in your domestic legislation you have to make changes within your own laws in order to in order to um, in order to uh, apply in order to you know follow what the provisions of trade related intellectual property rights are okay so it is quite intrusive that means after you have signed trips you have to make changes within your country's boundary okay within your laws okay the next important aspect of trip is that it is applicable to some goods and some goods and services which are of everyday necessities like medicine as i told you the case of the drug the cancer drug okay now before trips a, con a developing country was easily able to purchase a generic medicines at, at a cheaper rate okay at a cheaper rate from from a third party okay but after trips if a country is producing generic medicine okay generic medicines are like uh, you just have the formula as i told you the pharmaceutical company comes up with a formula after a long period of research and development comes up with a formula for producing a drug a medicine for cancer now somehow if you can get the formula you can get the formula in two ways: either buying the license from that pharmaceutical company and that will involve a huge cost or you can get the formula illegally so what happens that country most of the country they try to get the formula illegally and start producing medicines at a cheaper rate because if you buy the formula if you buy the patent the cost of the medicine is going to be high and the people of your country are not going to buy it because it is going to be of high price okay so what country do they try to produce generic medicines but trips trips is against the use of generic medicines against the use of generic medicines and many other technologies of of that matter for, for that sort okay so it is really uh, problematic for uh, the de developing countries okay after they have signed trips so one provision was included within trips article 8 it's it told that if there is a public health crisis if there is a public health emergency in a developing country like uh, then that country can override the patents if need be but this article was not made clear if it was simply written here to to just uh, to just comfort the interest of uh, uh, developing countries that if there is some public health crisis then that country can override the patent that country can use generic medicine but the provisions in article 8 that was not made quite clear that was not made quite clear okay so this is all about um, trade related intellectual property rights okay these are the issues involved here okay so we are end ending the session here only okay in the next lesson we are going to see Doha development agenda 
okay so till then take care of yourself thank you so much for watching keep learning goodbye hello friends my name is kumar arpit and i welcome you to this course on world trade organization before we begin the lesson here is a brief introduction of mine and a small request if you think that this course is helping you in any way then please consider rating reviewing and recommending it okay this means a lot to us in today's lesson we are going to understand doha development agenda a very important and crucial topic under wto okay this topic contains within it the fight the conflict that is going on between the developed and developing countries within wto okay so let us try to understand this doha development agenda now developed countries and developing countries these are the two groups to part of WTO okay and both want to use WTO for their own benefit to further their own interest okay for example dev developed country they want to use WTO to widen the scope of their market to get more and more market access in the world okay they want to increase their trade surplus okay by increasing their international trade the export okay they want to promote free trade and that is the reason why they use that is the reason they want to use WTO for they also want to have trade facilitation well trade facilitation means removing all the bureaucratic hurdles and a custom duties when the goods enters uh, the border of a country there are lots of procedures bureaucratic procedure regulations so to remove all those regulations a company or a country can be able to save some cost so that is called trade facilitation so these are all the things which are in the interest of developed country now similarly developing country they also want to use wto to promote their own interest they want to widen the scope of their market uh, access they want to increase their market access they also want to increase their trade surplus okay now look at here both developed country and developing country both developed country and developing country have their respective interest for participating in wto now let's have a look at what these two countries have to sell to the world that means what they have which they can sell to the world for example developed country they can sell the industrial product services technological goods intellectual property these are the product these are the stuffs these are the services which developed countries can sell to the world they have to sell they have these things to sell to the world similarly developing developing country they have comparative advantage in other sectors especially agricultural sector textile raw material because developing countries don't have uh, that infrastructure base that manufacturing base with which they can produce these industrial goods okay technological goods they don't even have the human resource base okay human capital enough human capital with which they can produce services so developing country have comparative advantage in these sectors okay and developed country have comparative advantage in these sectors and both try to sell what they can sell in the international market okay now conflict arise here developing country as i told you they have comparative advantage mainly in agriculture and textile production because agriculture and textile that does not uh, both of these both of the sector don't require sophisticated technology sophisticated infrastructure what they require is huge labor base and developing countries have human population in abundance like a huge labor population they have so they have this advantage in agricultural product and textile okay but agriculture and textile these are two very sensitive areas two very sensitive sectors these are called basic industries now no country wants to you know remain dependent on other country for food and for cloth okay so every country want to have a self sufficient agricultural sector and textile sector self sufficient basic industries now suppose though it is profitable for usa to purchase food grains from african countries from asian countries but usa would want to be self sufficient in food because they don't want to take risk what will happen if some some point of time in future these asian countries african countries stop exporting food grains to usa then what will happen so every country want to have food security so every country protect their agricultural sector protect their textile sector and that is true with developed countries also so as i told you right from the beginning of gat 1947 developed countries have excluded trade and a, a, a trade in agriculture and textile from international trade 
okay they have protected these industries developed country don't allow free trade in agriculture and textile why because these are basic industries very sensitive industries every country want to be self-sufficient in these in these two fields okay so problem comes from here now the first ministerial conference that was organized under wto was at singapore in 1996 okay and in this ministerial conference developed country forced forced the wto to include four new issues okay these four new issues were called singapore issues okay and all the topics that were included in these issues they were for the interest of the developed country like transparency in government procurement okay trade facilitation trade and investment trade and competition these are the four new issues that were that was included within wto for negotiation for negotiation okay these were called singapore issues developed country forcefully included these topics these issues within the scope of wto for negotiation okay now in in another trade conference that was held in seattle 1999 that was called millennium round well this this in ministerial conference in this ministerial conference developed country had thought that uh, a new trade round would start as we know that with the completion of Uruguay round in 1995 WTO was formed a new trade round was to be initiated okay and new trade round with new issues with new topics to negotiate that was to be initiated okay the topics were set in the Singapore the Singapore issues in Seattle round developed country decided to start a new trade round okay new trade round new round of negotiations okay but but the problem came here with developed and developing countries developed countries wanted negotiation in singapore issues okay they wanted negotiation in singapore issues they wanted to start new trade round with negotiation in singapore issues but developed con developing country they wanted liberalization in agriculture as i as we have seen that within within wto agreement on agriculture was made agreement on textile was made so developed country did make some promises on liberalizing agriculture but but after this five year, it was seen that um, those promises were not fulfilled. Developing countries felt cheated. They felt cheated, cheated because those promises which were made by developed countries for in, in, in case of liberalizing agriculture, trade in agriculture and textile, those promises were not fulfilled. Okay, so developed, developing countries, they said that first fulfill the promises you people have made okay for liberalizing trade in agriculture and textile then we can think of including new issues within wto framework or negotiation till then no new round of negotiation can start okay so in this way ministerial conference held in seattle in 1999 failed miserably that ministerial conference failed miserably okay now in 2001 a new ministerial conference was organized in Doha, okay, November 2001. Now, this time the situation was a bit different, okay, as we know that 26 uh, 9 11 was 9 9 11 happened, September 2001 terrorist activity, terrorist attack happened in USA. So, all the countries were quite fearful, okay, quite fearful because of this terrorist act. They wanted to save this multilateral organization, World Trade Organization, they want to promote international trade. Okay, because they thought that by promoting international trade, they can ensure some sort of world peace. So the voice of developing countries was a little bit toned down. Okay, in this Doha ministerial conference, November 2001, developed countries said that, okay, now look, if we people are not agreeing, we people are not agreeing on things like this, then whole WTO mechanism will fail. And this will give this will give a chance to the terrorist act terrorist groups out there to increase their activity and we may suffer attacks like 9-11 even more frequently okay so a new trade round was finally initiated in Doha okay in November 2001 and this trade round was called Doha trade round or Doha development agenda and within this trade round it was decided to reconcile the conflicting interest of developed and developing countries okay now what was the bargain that was made in this ministerial conference no nothing will happen and the trade round would not have started without some give and take so what developing countries got in doha ministerial conference 2001 developing countries got a declaration on trips and public health as i told you the trips included an article 8 which said that 
in case of public health emergency a country can override patent okay can use generic medicine but but the article was not clear developing country wanted a declaration from developed countries okay a declaration which allowed them to use generic medicine in case of public health emergency okay so that develop developing countries were quite sure that develop the developed countries are not going to drag them to the dispute settlement mechanism so that's what they got they got a declaration on on public uh, trips and public health in which developed countries allowed developing country to produce generic medicine under compulsory licensing during public health emergency like aids okay now developed countries also promised the developing countries that uh, market taxes will be given to them in case of non agricultural product and in return what developed country got they they indirectly included the singapore issues within the agenda of wto okay within the agenda of doha doha uh, trade round okay now trade round that was started in uh, in 2001 that was to be completed by 2005 okay a, a, another ministerial conference was held in 2003 at cancun okay in 2003 but it failed miserably now singapore issues agriculture and cotton they were the main bone of contention between developed and developing countries okay and developing countries formed a strong grouping called g20 okay and it presented a formal formidable challenge to the developed countries okay so in 2003 cancun ministerial conference the bone of contention the developed countries and developing countries they again came to conflict with each other with their, the issues were mainly singapore issues and agriculture okay and this time a new group of developing country emerged that was called g20 and they, that was that, that was a really formidable group of developing country and that stopped any further proceedings of of the negotiation okay so Can cancun ran also failed in 2005 Okay so after the failure of Cancun round a trade talk was held in Geneva in 2004 in 2004 a trade trade talk was held in Geneva in 2004 and the outcome of that trade talk was was often referred to as July package and in this July package what was given that developed country agreed to drop singapore issues okay and only the topic trade facilitation was included okay the issues of cotton was also included within the agenda and the date of completion of doha round was postponed indef indefinitely earlier it was set at 2005 but in in the july package 2000 july package 2004 the date what was postponed indefinitely singapore issues were dropped only trade facilitation was was kept other issues were dropped and that was the issues which uh, developing countries wanted to you know take out from the de development agenda so that were dropped okay so that that this is july package of 2004 okay now after 2004 many other trade rounds were organized like paris talk 2005 hong kong ministerial conference 2005 geneva talks again 2005 potsdam talks 2007 but nothing substantial happened in these trade talks regarding doha development agenda but in 2008 once again a trade talk was organized in geneva and this time it was expected that uh, doha round was finally going to come to an end for 9 days the trade the talk continued for 9 days it it appeared that doha round would finally end but this time also the the negotiation failed and this time the failed because there was some conflict between india usa and china related to some issues of agriculture okay so trade round finally failed in 2008 and till from then from then nothing substantial has happened till today regarding the doha development agenda it it appears some economists some scholars say that the doha development agenda has finally failed and we should start a new trade round okay after 2008 many other uh, uh, ministerial conferences were organized but nothing substantial happened in them regarding this doha development agenda the issue the bone of contention between developed and developing country still continues we are not we have not been able to meet uh, uh, we have not been able to draw a common plan for both developed and developing countries okay the talks still continue recently nairobi negotiations took place okay before that bali summit happened but nothing substantial happened in both the trade rounds okay so it continues here now this is all about uh, doha development agenda we are ending the course here whole course is finished okay i hope you people have learned something from this course i will be trying to come up with new course in the future till then take care of yourself keep learning thank you so much for watching goodbye